Hello everyone, welcome back to Naomi's Bookshelf. Today we're going to talk about And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. And Then There Were None was published November 6th in 1939, and it is Agatha Christie's most popular mystery of all time. It is by far like the best seller. I think it's still to this day of her work, if I'm not mistaken. It has a reputation, and I think it's a well-deserved reputation for her work. It has some genius plot twists in this that no one had done up until this time. So I wanna do a little quick, spoiler free synopsis but I'm going to go into some deep spoilers here because I really want to talk about what I found fascinating about this book and I want to go into it all with you all so here we go spoiler free quick brief synopsis in this book there are 10 people who are invited to an island under the premise of different situations some of them are invited there for work some of them are invited there to party some of them are invited there to just relax however they're all actually invited there because they have all committed murder in some way or another and they are all hiding that secret the law can't touch them and so one by one they start to die and therefore it starts to get scary it follows a poem and that's where the mystery comes in. They're trying to get off this island before they all die. That's the mystery. Fascinating. I go back to it again and again and again. I love it. And I think this gets better on the reread. So if you have read it and you think that it could be improved, I highly recommend rereading it because the clues could become better as you reread it and you see the genius of the clues throughout the book that are scattered. So I want to get into those clues that were scattered. Um, this is now where officially the spoilers come in because like I said, I want to discuss this book with everyone and share what I found fascinating theme-wise, character-wise, all of these little details. And I just want to talk about this book because it's so hard to review this book, the book I love, and not just like tell all. So we're going to tell all now. One thing that is very interesting about this book also is that the fact that this book has gone under several name changes and this edition at least has the name of 10 Little Indians in the cover which is the politically incorrect name that it was the second name of. So um, not quite the correct name. However, this is now its most famous name of And Then There Were None. So this book follows the poem, which I find quite a creepy poem, and I love the premise of the poem, because if you follow the poem as you're reading it for the first time, it definitely makes you feel uneasy as it, like you wait for the next death to come, and you know that it has something to do with it, and it also preys on everyone's mindset. I love how that poem just creates fear in everyone's minds. One thing I found fascinating about this was that everyone who decided to hold on to their guilt actually had to progressively suffer more psychological torture. So the ones who decided to not own up to it, like Emily Brent, she had to actually go longer into the mystery because she decidedly was like, I'm not guilty of this. However, Anthony Marsden, he uh, definitely was like, yeah, I did it. And that he was the first victim because he was just so obvious about it and he didn't have any shame. But he also owned up to it really easily. I found that to be fascinating how the characters who owned up to their past mistakes were very easily picked off. That was also the case with General MacArthur and Mrs. Rogers. How General MacArthur was like, yeah, I did it. I sent him to his death. And Mrs. Rogers was clearly not the mastermind of their employer's death. So she was clearly, yes, involved, but not the main murderer. So each of them were easily knocked off first and they had less to suffer through with every progressive death. So I found that to be an interesting play on Wargrave's sense of justice, where those who decided to hold on to their guilt actually had to wait longer to die. And therefore they had longer to mess with it. And people like Bloor who decided that, no, I'm never going to own up to the fact that, yeah, I did send a man to his death in prison. He actually ended up being third last. So he had a long way to go. However, Lombard, who fully was owning up to it the whole time along, he actually was second last. So in some ways, 
he never suffered psychologically, but he also was second last to go. So maybe it's because how heinous his crime was that he actually had to wait longer, essentially. But he never had the same psychological trauma as the others did, which I found to be really interesting, this whole book about psychological trauma and suffering while everyone was seeing ghosts of their previous victims. I found that to be very fascinating. Another theme I found quite interesting about this, and nothing was said online because I looked it up, uh, was the fact that they eat a lot of tongue. And I found that to be very fascinating because all of them are holding their tongues. None of them are speaking the truth about what they were involved with or the fact that they have killed people either through lack of actions or through direct actions. And they're eating tongue every single night or every single meal until finally they snap and Vera says, I'm never eating tongue again. It's very interesting to me that that was the main food choice that Wargrave sent to the island for them to all eat uh, as just a little, I don't know, maybe a reminder or something to just irk them with that they were eating the same meal every single time. But they kept eating tongue and they were holding their tongues non-stop. I found that to be a very interesting parallel. So let's talk Wargrave. Now Wargrave is a very fascinating character. He is introduced in a very unique way to make you trust him. I don't know how many of Agatha Christie's were actually independent novels before this, but this was her 32nd novel at this point. So all of her readers would have trusted the fact that we were meeting Wargrave first. He's the very first person you meet at the beginning. I want to read that line. It says, in the corner of the first class smoking carriage, Mr. Justice Wargrave, lately retired from the bench, puffed at the cigar and ran an interested eye through the political news at the Times. So instantly you're brought into this Hercule Poirot kind of feeling. And I think that Christy does this intentionally. She instantly brings us into this setting of this trusted uh, law abiding citizen who we can believe in. And we are bringing into this mystery someone who we trust because we know that we need someone to rely on. And Christy brings us the very first person, Justice Wargrave from the bench. We know we can trust him. He's a judge. Can we? That's the thing. And then next, we see him interact with many of the other characters. He's always this grandfatherly old character who we should trust, right? No. But we don't know that yet because of how Christy introduced him to us. We automatically have that judgment in our minds, that first opinion set in us. So the next thing that Christy does is she brings us into the situation where we trust him as investigator. So when the bodies are being discovered, it's suspicious. No one knows if it's murder though. They're kind of thinking it's not. But when the body of General MacArthur is discovered, it's clearly a murder. As readers, we need to trust somebody in the book. We need to know someone is reliable for us to follow. And in some cases, we might think Vera is reliable, but we also need someone else and we need some kind of investigator and we know Vera is not. So who do we trust? It's Justice Wargrave. And we think that he's reliable because of some things that Christy does. Firstly, she makes him examine the evidence like Hercule Poirot does. This is something that many of the detectives do in all of her books. On top of that, we have her independent books where the detectives do this as well. It's not just Hercule Poirot books that do this, but it is her independent books. Also the ones that have police detectives working with citizens. It's common in her books that we see this. So it's very fascinating to me that Christy sets us up for failure in recognizing the murderer and we all fall for it. At least I have never come across someone who knew it was the judge first glance. He also examines everyone's testimony. So you think that he is being reliable, unbiased, but by doing this, he actually makes you think and everyone else think that he is trustworthy. He makes everyone talk about what they've done, how they got there, exactly what happened. And he puts together all of the pieces of evidence, which would make you think he's very intelligent and trustworthy, but actually that's because he put all the pieces out there to begin with. But this makes everyone on the island trust him enough that they will do what he says, including hide all their weapons, lock them away, and prove what kind of weapons or what kind of medical morphine they have. 
anything like that, he has proof of right from the beginning. And no one is doubting his intelligence except for Lumbar and Vera. It's actually only Lumbar, but they have a discussion right after this whole courtroom case, which I will go back to. But it's really interesting when they immediately start discussing theories. This is the first time that we discuss theories in the book. And Lumbar and Vera are starting to say who they think it is. Lumbar says, uh, quite right, if I were to commit one or more murders, it'd be solely for what I would could get out of them. This mass clearance isn't in my line of country. Good, then we eliminate ourselves and, and concentrate on our fellow five prisoners. Which of them is you and Owen? Well, at a guess, and with absolutely nothing to go on, I'll pump for Wargrave. Oh, Vera sounded surprised. She thought for a minute or two and then said, why? Hard to say exactly, but to begin with, he's an old man and he's been presiding over courts of laws for years. That is to say, he's played God Almighty for a good many months every year. That must go to a man's head eventually. He gets to see himself as all-powerful, as holding the power of life or death, and it's possible that his brain might snap and he might want to go one step further and be executionary and judge or extraordinary. Vera personally goes for Dr. Armstrong as being the murderer, but it's fascinating that Lumbar, who is not hiding these secrets of what he's done, is not then being shadowed, and he can see with actual intent the real motive behind all of these things, even though he can't see that uh, Wargrave actually has these serial killer tendencies that we see later on in the like final letter, which is interesting. Judge Wargrave does something fascinating and he manages to remove suspicion from himself in a lot of ways by actually saying he's suspicious when he says that no one is above suspicion, not even a policeman or himself. So by saying that, I feel like he adds himself into the mix, but also by saying that he removes himself because he makes himself equal, but also he makes himself approachable to the everyone there by suggesting that he is completely at level playing field with them all. He is also saying that he is not above reproach, but that also means that he is trying to solve the mystery with them. Therefore, he is not a suspect. It is such a reverse psychology, I think, that makes it work for me and works for everyone that I've seen read this book. Vera has a moment of insight during this scene, which I think is really fascinating. So this comes when Judge Wargrave is saying that anyone could have done this, even a person who is extremely weak. Also, excusing himself by including himself. So Vera cried angrily, I think you're mad. His eyes turned slowly till they rested on her. It was the dispassionate stare of a man well used to weighing humanity in the balance. She thought, he's just seeing me as, as a specimen. And the thought came to her with real surprise. He doesn't like me much. With measured tones, the judge was saying, my dear young lady, do try and restrain your feelings. I'm not accusing you. He bowed to Miss Brent. I hope, Miss Brent, that you are not offended by my insistence that all of us are equally under suspicion. So you see what I'm saying? He is accusing everyone, but at the same time, he's also excusing himself by making himself approachable, at least to my thinking. That's how I see it. And that's how I've always read it the first time around. And that's why it was just shock to me because he makes himself so approachable. Just like Hercule Poirot in Death and the Clouds when he is in the airplane, but you trust him because he's Hercule Poirot. So just like in this one, Justice Wargrave is there. He is a member on the island, but we've been introduced to him. He is investigating. He is easily there. And Christy introduces us to him in a way that you think he's reliable, more reliable than the police officer. And then he's the guy who did it. Like, genius. Genius. I think it's a brilliant way of Agatha Christie creating this way. And if you read it, you can see Justice Wargraves weaving in and out of these stories. And the way that he brings this all together is fascinating. I love the way that she creates the story and makes it so impossible to guess the first time around and then the second time around when you know it. If you do know it, if you haven't guessed, if you've forgotten, like I have in some Christie's, then you're surprised again. 
if you know it and then it's just so genius because you see all the clues I think it's brilliant so those are my thoughts on this one I think there's a lot to say about the themes of uh, murdering people and justice that can't be served by the law I think there's a lot of those kind of discussions to be had but those are the things I really pulled out of this book so please let me know down in the comments what your favorite part of this book is or who's your favorite character what do you think of this amazing plot or if you're going to reread it or if you're just wanting to hear for the spoilers and now you're going to read it for the first time and see all the clues I would love to talk about and then there were none with you down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, you can put a big thumbs up there. And if you are new here, you can subscribe. I do a lot of Christy content and you can always hit that bell if you'd like to be notified every time I put out a video. I will see you next time. Bye for now.